If you're doing everything right and you're checking all the boxes, understanding what are the one, two, three, or four individual bottlenecks in your metabolism is probably gonna be a lot more informative about to how you can get an extra 10 years of high quality life. Chris, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Sam. Great to be here. Yeah, uh, you've been on the podcast for several times and uh, I, th I always like to refer to you or re resort back to you in terms of the finest details and nitty gritty of all the micronutrients and different metabolic pathways, because I think yeah, like you're one of the best uh, people out there who just, you know, obviously share such good information about these topics in such a like more simplistically understandable way. But also, yeah, like going uh, much more or going in like the, all the detail and you know, all the in depth with all these, uh, n you know, related to metabolic pathways and uh, different kinds of nutrients. So, in this uh, episode, I wanted to talk about mostly, you know, what's the role of different kinds of micronutrients and vitamins and minerals uh, for longevity? Because, you know, usually people talk about, okay, what foods do I eat? What's the macros and what's the food groups? Uh, is it vegan? Is it keto? Is it carnivore? Is it paleo? Uh, but uh, yeah, like what's the actual, we I want to talk about like what's the actual like micronutrients and uh, different kinds of, you know, other compounds that are more like, you know, under underlying the macronutrients, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, I'm I'm the detailed guy, so. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I, th I think, you know, my audience is also very familiar with the idea behind you know glycine and methionine and you know protein is probably the biggest thing that comes up when people talk about food and longevity so that you need to like restrict your protein eat a low protein diet uh, because if you eat too much protein it makes you grow too fast and gives you cancer or those kind of things so we you know it's actually many layers deeper than that obviously there's like the amino acids that play different roles in that longevity process so uh yeah like what's What's, you know, maybe you can start with like, what's the role of these main, main amino acids in this, like the glycine and uh, methionine? Well, I think the first thing that you need to think about is you need to get into a little bit more granular detail when you're, when you're talking about what you mean by longevity. Mm. And I think one of the biggest problems in the longevity space is that people focus on longevity at the expense of focusing on what not to die of. Right. And you wind up looking at experiments in worms or, you know, if you're lucky, rodents, <laughs> maybe monkeys sometimes, <laughs> right. um, where the reality is not like the human reality at all. And it's, and I'm not talking about that a monkey's not a human or a mouse isn't a human or a worm isn't a human. I'm talking about the fact that in animal experiments, you have highly controlled conditions where they are not likely to die of the things that humans are likely to die of. So if you trace, if you look at like, number one, what are the proportions of, of causes of death? And number two, in what sequence do they occur in? Most people are going to die of heart disease or cancer, but if you aren't doing what you need to protect yourself against a physical injury when you're young, there's no point in really optimizing for protection yeah. against cancer. Um, you know, at, at this point, you're lucky. You like you are very well endowed genetically, or very well supported nutritionally, um, and and or just lucky if you get to die of cancer because that means that you passed through heart disease. Like if you look at what was the leading cause of death over time, it was tuberculosis in the 19th century, and then it became heart disease because people lived long enough to get that. And as emergency medicine became better at treating heart attacks in the moment, it became cancer because having a heart attack was not necessarily a death sentence. Hmm. And when you're thinking about that, in order to get to dying of natural causes, where you might be concerned with this generic longevity factor type of thing that you would be studying in animal experiments, you have to make your way through not dying of physical injury, not dying of diabetes, not dying of respiratory infections, not dying of heart disease, not dying of cancer, et cetera. Mm. Um, and most of us are not even getting there. So if you're looking at something like protein, you want to be thinking first and foremost 
what prevents sarcopenia and what prevents osteopenia and osteoporosis. Because if you fall and fracture your hip when you're in your 60s, you're lucky if you make it past the year, <laughs> according to the according to the longitudinal studies. Like there's a very high mortality rate from just that, right? So it's almost like why are we even thinking of someone presented an abstract at a conference in a mouse study about methionine and glycine balance before we're thinking of what's the right amount of muscle mass that we want to have? What's the right amount of bone mass that we want to have? And what's the effect of protein on that, right? So mm. I would say first and foremost, you want a high high enough protein intake to maintain high quality bone mass and muscle mass. And you really have to think about this starting young because peak bone mass is age 25 to 30 and it's all downhill from there. Now, it's not necessarily all downhill at an individual level because you can come in with lower than normal bone mass and you can fix your diet and fix your training program and you can increase it. But at a population level, you hit peak bone mass at 25 or 30 and then it's just downhill from there. That means that you want to you wanna be thinking about this when you're, in, when you're 20 years old mm. so that you can prepare yourself to have the highest peak muscle and bone mass that you can have when you're 25. And the slowest descent after that, basically. Um, and again, on an individual level, sure, you can become a pro bodybuilder when you're 35 and you can increase your muscle mass. But like generally speaking, the trajectory is downward from there. Um, now, with that said, there is some evidence that in a general longevity sense, you do want a balance between the sulfur amino acids, methionine, and cysteine that are abundant in animal proteins, especially milk and eggs above all, uh, but are much more abundant in animal proteins and plant proteins. And glycine, which is rich in the collagenous tissue of those animal proteins. Um, and the general gist of this is that methionine, too much methionine is going to deplete your glycine. Glycine is, is protective, uh, in longevity. And if you just look at what was the ancestral intake of animal proteins, I mean, typically you are not even distant ancestors, but typically our great grandparents, at least as recent as great grandparents, probably grandparents would be largely eating the whole animal in which half the animal mass basically is collagenous tissues. And so you would naturally have that if I ate meat, I also ate bone, I also ate skin. And I think one interesting thing is you brought up at the beginning this debate between vegan versus carnivore versus whatever. In a sense, from the methionine glycine balance standpoint, you have some optionality between the two. Because if you eat nose to tail carnivore and you eat vegan, both of those have a pretty decent balance between methionine and glycine. Um However, vegan, it, it's hard to get enough. And I, I, look, the, the vegan bodybuilders are going to come at me for this, but <laughs> generally speaking, it's harder, much harder to hit your total protein target on a vegan diet. Mm. Um, you know, probably you're not going to be able to do that except with protein supplements. And when you start deviating from that, you have to, you, you know, if you're on pea protein, you're still going to have a better methionine, um, methionine glycine balance than on like lean chicken breast. Um, but as you deviate from the whole foods, vegan diet, you do have to micromanage your balance more. So you're not as automatically protected as you would be on a sort of whole foods vegan diet. Mm. But, but that is sort of like, well, you better skip over osteopenia and osteoporosis and yeah. all those other things in between. If you want to leverage that methionine and glycine balance in your vegan diet towards living to 95 or 105. Right. Yeah, it's like the the biggest irony is that you go on this low protein diet to live longer, but then you still die to a hip fracture, you know, in your seventies or eighties, you know, yeah, like sixty five or something like that already. So yeah, like you definitely there's like layers to this longevity thing. Like yeah, first make yeah, sure that you sure. get to you know fifties, um, or you know first make sure that you don't die to like 
like some, a pr- pr- you know, some some tragic event that you could prevent, like you know, not putting a seatbelt on or <laughs> those kind of things. Um, so yeah, like the, you know, at any or different ages, you have like different focuses. Like if you're young, then you have to focus on slightly different things, like mostly you know, building this reservoir of muscle tissue and bone density and other fitness parameters that inevitably do decline with the decades. Even if you're like you know, elite level athlete your VO2 max and strength do decline regardless. You you decline significantly less than someone someone who doesn't exercise at all, but it's still going to, it's like, you know, damage control over the course of decades. And if you start at a higher point and if you like enable yourself to reach a higher point with your muscle strength and muscle mass and VO2 max and bone density, then you fall to a, like a higher standard in five decades, for example. Yeah. Uh, but But let's say, what is the like, reason why excess methionine could be harmful for uh and and in what situations uh it is uh let's say negatively impacting health and uh like longevity well i think it's easier to say the potential negative effects on health than it is on longevity just because there's not a whole lot of research in the lifespan front um Mm. but when you uh when you get too i mean if you consume more methionine than you need um part of the negative health impact will be glycine buffering so what happens is methionine is used to methylate things and in the process the process of methylation is what we use for things like synthesizing creatine synthesizing phosphatidylcholine regulation of gene expression, uh, regulation and synthesis, regulation and decomposition of various neurotransmitters and hundreds of different things. Uh, And because we use it for so many hundreds of different important things, we need to regulate it. And what happens is when you have a sudden influx of methionine through eating a steak, for example, you will have more methyl groups than you need that come from that methionine and you will use glycine to buffer them. And if the balance is handleable, you will later salvage those methyl groups in the fasting state. But if the methionine influx is high enough, you're going to run out of your ability to do that recycling and you're just going to lose the glycine and the methyl groups in the urine. Mm. So under those circumstances, you're losing glycine and that's has all kinds of potential negative health consequences. Glycine is important as an inhibitory neurotransmitter that helps you uh, cool down your body temperature when you sleep, so your sleep could suffer. Uh, Glycine is important as a detoxifier, so your detoxification of drugs and environmental toxins and things that you don't want in food chemicals uh, could suffer. Uh, For example, salicylates are a compound in food that are detoxified primarily with glycine. And although salicylates are not, uh, you know, the average person can handle them. um, They also hurt your energy metabolism by poking holes in the mitochondrial respiratory chain and by inhibiting various enzymes. Some people are salicylate sensitive and they get direct symptoms when they consume salicylates. The average person's going to have some kind of decline in their energy metabolism at minimum, even if it's not symptomatic from not being able to clear those with glycine. There's studies that show that glycine helps stabilize blood sugar. So losing glycine is probably going to compromise your blood sugar handling. And if you look at the list of the top 10 major killers, diabetes is one of those things. And so there could be a relationship there. Um, and glycine is extremely important for your own collagen and as a result it's you know from a beauty perspective it's important from for like kind of looking like you're not aging too fast but internally the that co- you know collagen is is uh providing structures around all your internal organs and it's the major protein in bone um so from the perspective of going back to that list of top 10 killers and seeing osteoporosis on there, it's also going to be important in that respect. Uh, Then on top of that, too many sulfur amino acids get metabolized to sulfate, which is good for us. But on the way there, they get metabolized to sulfite, which is highly toxic. And so having 
chronically elevated sulfite levels is is probably going to cause kind of like low level toxicity that could probably elevate inflammation levels, uh, contribute to the anxiety problems and all kinds of stuff like that. That's going to maybe not cause a top 10 killer, but still kind of slightly tug on your mm. on your longevity strings uh, in the background. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, and yeah, like glycine has, you know, a ton of many different roles like glutathione and creatine and heme synthesis and bile acid synthesis. So it's like almost, you know, it's it's considered a non-essential amino acid. But, uh, you know, if you look at it, what it does and, you know, given the fact that your body actually doesn't make that much of it and most people aren't eating that much glycine either from diet, then it's like you you would still like most people are like deficient in glycine actually at least the standard person who doesn't eat any these glycine rich foods like you know tendons and chicken skin or fish skin and uh, gelatin powder yeah on top of that the glycine pathway is basically dependent on carbohydrate and folate so most glycine is synthesized from pyruvate which is the end product of glycolysis that you mm. get when you burn carbs that's converted to serine and converting serine to glycine requires uh, the unmethylated form of folate. So you need a high folate and B12 intake. Um, and that, you know, the, the methionine glycine balance is probably going to be worst in people who are low carb, high meat, you know, like a carnivore diet has to have, horrible methionine and glycine balance if it's if it's like a steak only diet mm. um, because you're not only not consuming the the glycine rich parts of the animal but you're also you have extreme carbohydrate restriction and low folate intake which are going to trash your endogenous glycine synthesis mm. right yeah unless you're eating actually nose to tail <laughs> so in that case you're well, that's why i said yeah. a steak only carnivore diet right? oh yeah yeah you can yeah. you can certainly do a carnivore diet nose to tail for sure that's <laughs> sort of like a old um kind of like old school saladino carnivore mm. versus the sean baker carnivore <laughs> yeah. yeah well i i would, would be interested to know like what's their homocysteine levels um i I, don't, I haven't heard that you're sharing those but um yeah because you know if you are not getting enough glycine and you're eating a lot of methionine then your uh, homocysteine levels will also uh, no, rise, which no, is no. quite no, harmful. No, 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 that's not, that's not right. So your your homocysteine is not going to be a good uh, reflector of of methionine glycine balance at all. Because if you have an influx of methionine, what glycine does is it takes the methyl group away from methionine to generate homocysteine. Hmm. So homocysteine is going to be much more linearly track with methionine intake, regardless of glycine. Okay. Um you need B6 to break down the homocysteine. Um, well, you know, I guess under, um, so you do need serine or glycine in order to break down homocysteine using the vitamin B6 dependent transsulfuration pathway. So I suppose, I guess you're, you're right, but just not the way that I was thinking about it. So a steak only carnivore diet the big the big problem on the homocysteine level has it's unrelated to glycine buffering but it is related to the fact that if your serine and glycine levels are low because a you're not synthesizing serine from glycolysis and b you're not consuming glycine that is uh I mean, there will be serine in meat, so it's not gonna it's not gonna be the worst case scenario. But you're gonna have lower endogenous serine synthesis from carbohydrate, and you and you don't have the glycine, and so that probably does compromise the transsulfuration pathway. So that might increase, uh, but that you would see that primarily as an increase in postprandial homocysteine rather than fasting homocysteine. In mm -hmm. fact, you might argue that in that case, fasting homocysteine would be. Um, misleadingly low and make your lab work look better than it is <laughs> ah gotcha yeah yeah because um you know homocysteine in uh if it's too high then that's it's a cardiovascular disease uh, risk factor so how you know it's obviously not the like i don't know like how 
in terms of like the tiers, like how high of a risk factor it is. Obviously, like blood pressure is probably much bigger or insulin resistance, but like how how bad is the high homocysteine if you yeah like have too much methionine? I guess it depends how high it is. Um, I mean, I I don't I don't really think of it like that. I mean, I think of it more like if your homocysteine is high, that's a reflection of the metabolic pathway being backed up, mm. and I take it more of as more of an indicator than than otherwise, right? Like if your homocysteine's high because your folate is low, you got bigger problems than just the homocysteine being high. You you have a folate deficiency. <laughs> mm. If your homocysteine's high because your B twelve is deficient, you got bigger. You know, like you can you could you could do. Uh, they don't do this, but like if you if you did homocysteine plasma apheresis and took the homocysteine out of the plasma and put the plasma back in, that's not going to stop you from having irreversible central nervous system de degeneration from the B12 deficiency, right? So yes, homocysteine is a factor because it causes it causes too much homocysteine, causes oxidative stress. But I think that's kind of a distraction from the fact that if your homocysteine is high, you got something else that's wrong that has a bunch of other negative effects that you need to figure out. Mm, gotcha, yeah. And by the way, homocysteine can be totally normal and you can have serious problems in your methylation and transsulfuration pathways. Mm. Um, and you would never catch them in, unless you run a, a more, uh, more expansive panel. Mm. Yeah, true. Uh, and, you know, obviously when you're talking about methylation, then, or just, you know, methane in itself is, you know, essential nutrient. You don't want to be like too low methane either or like you you don't want to obviously avoid all methane and it's virtually impossible because like all foods have uh, some methane so yeah you just need to <laughs> yeah i think that's i think that's also like not um not something that you want to do anyway because methionine is used to synthesize for example glutathione which is the master cellular antioxidant it's incredibly important for detoxification uh, it's used for synthesizing taurine, which is uh, important in the central nervous system, especially it's used for synthesizing sulfate, which is very important for hormone uh, regulation and for detoxification. So I think it's, I mean, it's from a biochemical perspective, it seems pretty clear that you want a lot of methionine and glycine. And that really also, that, that really also goes back to the Let's take our heads out of the like the generic longevity basket and just think about what's killing people first. Mm. You want high protein for good bone mass and good muscle mass. Yeah. So, right. so, so what's across the, the board? It, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Like what's the, then what's like a good ratio or like how do you like how do you see like a optimal protein uh, structuring for just you know maintaining the good muscle mass and also not you know doing any harm. Yeah, I think that um I think it's 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 pretty easy to say how much protein do you need for optimal body composition. I mean that that data suggests that the minimum would be 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight and the sweet spot is probably closer to double that. Um if you had a if if you had a exclusively body composition related goal, you might want to triple it. But if you're just looking at optimal muscle mass, I think you want you're shooting basically between a half a gram. If you think about your weight in pounds, a half a gram to a gram of protein of non collagen protein per uh, pound of body weight, and um, you multiply that by two point two. If you're thinking about your weight in kilograms. Um, in terms of balancing with collagen, you could think about it a couple ways. Uh, I think as a general rule of thumb, you basically want uh, about a minimum of 15 grams of collagen for every 100 grams of non-collagen animal protein. But you, I could definitely conceive of the possibility that tra traditional ancestral intakes were much higher on the glycine side, on the collagen side, just on the basis that the weight of an animal carcass is basically 
in terms of the non-collagen, the co collagen rich animal protein. Um, there's certainly, you have to adjust that for the accessibility, right? Like, so it's, it's certainly easier to eat the muscle meat of an animal than to consume all the collagen that's inside the bone, which requires pulverizing it. Um, and certainly like a lot of the collagenous tissue is not super chewable. Uh, right. So if you, if you adjust that downward, so if, if you say like 50% skeletal muscle, 50% collagen rich tissue, you probably got to take the edibility of the collagen rich tissue down to like cut it into a fifth basically, because you're either you're boiling it and you're getting whatever comes out in the boil or you're pulverizing part of the bone, which you're mainly using as a calcium source, um, mm. et cetera. Right. So if you, if you account for the edibility, it's probably going to be somewhere around, uh, you know, every hundred grams of protein gets 20 grams of collagen, something like that. Um, but I, I came to, when I came up with 15 grams of collagen for every hundred grams of non-collagen animal protein, I was also looking at like what would restore the methionine glycine balance of plant foods. And it kind of works out that way. So because there's no randomized controlled trials of different ratios of these things versus longevity, yeah, I'm I'm just trying to find like what's the consensus between different types of ways that you would think about it, um, mm -hmm. and so I think when you when you think about it in multiple different ways, like what's the what would our ancestors get? What would have a kind of consensus balance between whole animal and plants? Um, it all kind of works out like that. But another way to think about it that would allow you to go a little higher would be what are the potential therapeutic uses of glycine? And if you look at uh, human trials, you're basically looking at three to five grams with a meal can help stabilize blood sugar. Three grams before bed can help with sleep. Um, three to five grams in the context of gelatin. So 15 grams of gelatin, but not lower doses. 15 grams of gelatin has got about five grams of glycine in it. Um, in that context before exercise, it can help collagen synthesis in joints. So if you're kind of combining these, you could say, well, you know, five grams with each meal, three grams before bed, um, five grams before exercise, then you could argue for like a 20 to 25 gram intake of glycine if you're maximizing the therapeutic value. Um, excluding the studies of schizophrenia using 60 grams, mm. <laughs> which by the way is, I believe is like roughly equivalent to what gets turned over in, in the maximal collagen turnover, which is highly variable between people, but like mm. the maximal turnover, like the maximal estim maximal estimated individual glycine turnover is some, somewhere around that 60 grams that, uh, yeah. has been used as an antipsychotic for schizophrenia. But so if you look at it like that, I would say like I would create a window and say the baseline is getting this five extra grams of glycine a day from 15 grams of collagen for each hundred grams of non-collagen animal protein in your diet. So that looks like maybe if you're on the upper range of supporting your body composition with the with the regular so-called regular protein, maybe you're getting 150 grams a day if you weigh 150 pounds and then you're adding to that um 22 and a half grams of collagen about a third of that is glycine um and then that's the bottom of the window and then the top of the window would be maybe 20 to 25 grams of glycine which you would get from 60 to 75 grams of collagen or gelatin um or uh, divide that by 10 and you have the cups of bone broth that you would have to drink uh, or you could just, or you could be getting it from glycine powder or whatever. Mm. Um, so that, I mean, if you get it from glycine powder, it's, it is that 20 to 25 grams. If you're getting it from any of those other sources, you're looking at three times that for the collagen based protein. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, the amount of glycine you could eat is yeah, like pretty high <laughs> per day. Like, uh, you know, I think there are some experiments even like that 90 grams 
per day is also like pretty safe and uh, no side effects so uh, but uh yeah like there are maybe like a few side effects for some people like I've, I've heard them say that you know headaches or nausea or something like that but um you know that could be because we'll do of the... that to someone with a glycine cleavage system disorder, and you're going to put them in the hospital, and they might die. But so there's, <laughs> there's, there's individual variation in, in everything. But yeah, yeah, I think that I mean the lesson is that the the take the 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 random person who submits themselves to research studies and doesn't get kicked out at the enrollment pr process, that person as a prototype is probably going to be able to tolerate a massive amount of glycine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, there's so many reasons to take glycine, I think, uh, besides, you know, e even if there's like, yeah, like no, this methionine thing is, yeah, like, doesn't matter. Uh, there's, yeah, like just the other benefits for the collagen alone, it's like, uh, you know, you do need, you know, at minimum, like 12 grams of glycine for the collagen turnover. And like I said, it could be even like higher, like up to 60 or 36 grams or yeah, depends on what reference to someone uses or what uh, you know what uh, thoughts or op opinions they have about it yeah but i i mean the big elephant in the room though is that um endogenous glycine synthesis is not a constant and it's going to be highly correlated with carbohydrate intake the rate of glycolysis and the availability of tetrahydrofolate which is the unmethylated form of folate which requires having a high folate intake and requires a very robust turnover of folate in the methylation system and the other systems that folate is involved in. So if you have a very high flux of folate through those systems, a very high folate intake and a very high carbohydrate intake so that you're relying primarily on carbohydrate oxidation, you're probably going to need a lot less glycine. Whereas if you are on a carnivore diet, um, your glycine needs are going to be way higher because you're kind of maxing you're bottoming out all those processes, the carbohydrate intake, the folate intake, the folate flux, et cetera. Mm. Gotcha. Um, you mentioned taurine a little bit while ago, which is uh, interesting or relevant because like a few weeks ago, there was this this uh, mouse study that uh, showed that the taurine supplementation extended their mouth, the lifespan of their mice. So, uh, you know, obviously it's not a human study or anything, but uh, what do you think about what of role of taurine and what's like the benefits of taurine and what do you think of adding it as a supplement? Well, I didn't see that study, so I'm not, I'm not too sure. I mean, taurine is, um, it's important. Well, it's important for um, bile acid conjugation and it's important as a, it's kind of in the central nervous system, it's kind of aligned with GABA. Um, but it also is just an intermediate in transsulfuration. So it's sparing to sulfur amino acids uh, and it is a precursor to sulfate. Um, so you, it's, I mean, without, without redoing that study, blocking various different pathways, it's kind of hard to figure out what the, living longer um part of that is uh you know you it, you might just be inhibiting the transsulfuration process and um sparing sulfur amino acids or something like that i don't know sparing mm -hmm. gotcha yeah yeah in the well in the study like the human equivalent dose that it took was three to six grams uh where they saw the life extension extension and uh, I think they the the rationale or the, like the mechanisms was yeah like through like some you know cardio protection or something like that uh, or in addition to like other things but like you know part of the reason I think the the taurine has like some benefits is also like the heart heart health uh, benefits if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, well, there was a uh, research in humans going back decade many decades ago from like the mid 20th century where high provision of sulfur compounds was shown to be very protective in humans against heart disease and um i'm pretty sure all the sulfur compounds were interchangeable and so it was like the hypothesis at that time was that it was from sulfate because like it didn't matter which sulfur compound you provided they were all equally protective in the models that they were using mm. right and uh, sulfur or sulfate helps with uh, glutathione like the main mineral for that well 
um, the argument back in the day was that it was helping with cholesterol uptake. So I don't know. Did, did if you saw that mouse study, did they look at the blood lipid levels? Although mice are terrible as models of human uh, hmm. blood lipids, but did you? Uh, did you uh, did no, I I didn't I didn't recall anything like that. But yeah, like interesting that there's a, there is in Japanese at least there is one paper talking about that you know the Japanese get a lot of taurine in their diet. <laughs> and uh that's uh you know part of the at least the paper speculated that that's one of the reason why japanese have like some better longevity and of course there's other things that contribute to that but yeah like the seafood and all the sea vegetables they're actually the highest source of dietary taurine or one of the highest sources of uh and eat, they're even higher in taurine than uh like meat and stuff hmm. but yeah <laughs> that can be another topic for another discussion um Unless you want to like add anything about it. No, not really. Um, I mean, I, I guess, no, I guess I would just say that it's like without highlighting the exact mechanism, it's difficult to say where it would fit in, in the human case, hmm. right? because it's way more humans are dying of discernible causes of disease than are dying of old age. My grandfather died of old age. I mean, he he had no particular health problems and he was like, well, I'm going to be dying soon. <laughs> and um, he was like, I can feel it. God's calling me. And everyone right. got prepared for a year. And then he was like, yep, I'm going to lay down. And then, <laughs> uh, and then he asked people to pray over him. And then he just like laid there and gradually lost various functions over the course of a week. Um you know, but most people don't die like that. Like most people are, you know, they wind up if they either got run over by a car or they had a heart attack or they had a cancer, or they, um, you know what I mean? So I just, the longevity studies in animals are not the top thing that I'm going to look at. And mm. I'm not saying there's not a general longevity factor. I'm just saying that you don't you're you don't even gain the right to be concerned with the general longevity factor until you don't die of an infection, don't die of you know that that whole list, right? And so, um, it's interesting, uh, and I'd like to know why it is, but I, but like that's that's just not the first. That's not the that whole field of research is not the going to be the first place I'm going to look for how to live longer. Mm. Right. Yeah, like you obviously the first focus is to avoid the chronic diseases and maintain a good health span, if that makes sense, like the living healthier for longer. Yeah. And you know, on that on that um note, I I strongly, strongly suspect that after you hit the low hanging fruit of things that are obviously healthy, um, what is any given person's personal longevity strategy is probably highly unique to them because I think that there's, let me, let me just kind of introduce this topic. So on average, everyone uh, on average, people are each person's carrying one to two clinically relevant rare mutations for genetic disease, and they don't have a genetic disease because they're either heterozygous for it and it's not manifesting as a genetic disease, but it is probably one of the biggest bottlenecks in their metabolism. Um, if that's the case, it probably doesn't matter if the person is eating crap and inside all day and not exercising. But if you're doing everything right and you're checking all the boxes, I think understanding what are the one, two, three, or four highly unique individual bottlenecks in your metabolism is probably going to be a lot more informative about to how you can get an extra 10 years of high quality life than looking at like what, what increases the group mean lifespan among mice. Mm. Um, because if 
I mean, let's just look, I, I, it's easier to illustrate it with a couple of big examples, right? So um, you don't want diabetes, right? Um, there's uh, things that obviously increase the risk of diabetes in the general population. And there's obvious reasons why diabetes has become very common in our society. And that's some of the clearly demonstrated like factors are obesity and overweight. Um, some of the contentious factors are sugar intake some of the sort of fringe hypothesis, but maybe true factors are artificial lighting and environmental toxins and all that stuff. But I would, I'm going to, I'll have better numbers on it in the next couple of months because I'm in the midst of analyzing this data, but I'm going to, right now I'm just going to guesstimate that somewhere around 30% of people probably have a rare mutation that is a unique block in carbohydrate, fat, or protein metabolism. And it's different for each person because there's hundreds of these, right? There's, there's, you know, on the order of seven or 800 different, um, cl like full blown clinical diseases of energy metabolism. And they're all, each one is very rare, but collectively, um, most people have one or two of these, of these very rare things, right? So like 30% of those are something that's going to fundamentally impair your, your ability to metabolize a certain amino acid or a certain type of fatty acid or carbohydrate generally, et cetera. Right. And so why don't all fat people get diabetes? Why don't all people in America get diabetes? Why don't all people who have office jobs get diabetes? obviously it's because of these different things between them. Right. And now you can, there's voluminous data on the many, many, many common polymorphisms that might correlate with diabetes risk. But if you're walking around with a, you know, 50% of a defect in a thiamine transporter, um, you know, your residual risk of getting diabetes after you control for being lean, going outside, being active and all the, all the general things that we know everyone should do is probably far more determined by the fact that you have cut down your, your thiamine transport by 50% such that on a good diet, you will have a thiamine deficiency, mm. right? Like, and, yeah. and that's just one of those things, right? That could be, um, there could be hundreds of others. And so I think that that person their longevity is probably going to be primarily influenced by thiamine supplementation, mm. right? The, the fact that taurine can give a little bit of an edge to all mice for that person is probably less important than the fact that they have a unique bottleneck in their energy metabolism that is at the point of thiamine and that thiamine supplementation is the one thing they can do to fix it. Mm. Um, you know, and it, to be clear, if they're obese and they don't exercise and they're indoors all day, et cetera, like they probably don't, thiamine's probably not the thing they should be thinking about. Um, you know, but I mean, we're not talking to that type of person anyway. We're, you know, we're talking to the the highly motivated people. And so I think that after you, after you say, okay, I've, I've checked all the boxes to, protect myself from injuries, respiratory infections, diabetes, osteoporosis, heart disease, cancer. Um, now what do I do to get more longevity? I just think it's it's going to be like your, the next good 10 years of high quality life you, that you could add is probably going to come from introspecting on your own uniqueness rather than to the general longevity literature is mm -hmm. the way I see it. Yeah, that's a very good good point. Like uh, genetics is obviously massive, and uh, you know the centenarians themselves, like they uh, they you know mo a lot of centenarians do follow like a relatively healthy lifestyle, or they follow the fundamentals. But you know most of the centenarians, at least I think, <laughs> the reason they live long is they have like some good genes, or they live in this environment that enables their particular genes to reach their maximum or reach a longer life if that makes sense and yeah like if you have like a particular bad gene 
in whatever it is or this uh, bottleneck in whatever it is pathways then uh yeah like you're gonna be like you know not broken but your body will function at a much lower you know efficiency and uh yeah like just fixing that is gonna give you like a massive improvements and i think like the most i think most common example most people have heard about is the like the mthfr gene so methylation uh, genes so uh yeah like for those people who are like poor methylators then fixing their or supporting their methylation is gonna be like one of the most important things for their you know not just longevity but also like overall health and uh, you know how they how they function during daytime yeah i'm not talking about that though so the mt you i mean you could split mthfr into the thing that everyone's talking about and the thing that i'm talking about so the thing that everyone's talking about with mthfr is the common polymorphisms the c677t and a1298c polymorphisms the thing is the, there's and i don't have either of them but i'm one of 13 percent of people that don't have any of those um and you know you you can add, I, I mean i i'm not going to say it's not relevant but the relevance is is probably that um if you have low mthfr activity based on those common polymorphisms you probably need an extra 1.6 milligrams of riboflavin a day and then you should probably move on to thinking about something else and that's not to say that um well look here's the thing so if you look at homocysteine levels and i'm i'm not saying homocysteine is the be all end all of um of methylation but it is an index of the function of the MTHFR enzyme because if you're making enough methylfolate, you're using it to recycle homocysteine. And there's if there's also very there's also rare genetic defects in MTHFR that are much stronger and they're associated with way higher homocysteine levels, like in the hundreds. Um, or for people who are homozygous in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And um, and if you look at C677T, basically, if you are um, homozygous for it, you have elevated homocysteine. If you are compound heterozygous for C677T and A1298C, you have somewhat lower homocysteine, but it's 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 still higher than normal. And when you get down to one copy of C677T, it's like, eh, maybe your homocysteine is like a little bit high, but it's not very consistent. And people with A1298C who don't have C677T don't have elevations of homocysteine at all. And if you, you know, then you add on the very rare um, MTHFR mutations where you can get homocysteine up even higher than that, you basically just have a linear, um, a linear inverse correlation between MTHFR activity and homocysteine. So high MTHFR activity is normal homocysteine. And as you go down, uh, it takes, you have to kind of get down like 40 or 50% of MTHFR activity to see a rise. And then you just start seeing uh, it rise depending on which mutation you have. The more MTHFR activity goes down, the higher homocysteine goes. And then if you have, if you're an edge case with a very severe def defect, homocysteine just go keeps, goes all the way up like that, right? So why are, why do 87% of people have at least one of these polymorphisms? Obviously, it's because they don't matter that much. And why wouldn't they matter that much? Probably because riboflavin intakes used to be higher in ancestral populations and allowed these mutations to spread without causing harm. Because what the studies show is that if you take someone who's homozygous for C677T, if you add 1.6 milligrams of riboflavin to their basal intake of riboflavin, so you're probably bringing it up to somewhere around three, three and a half milligrams total, you abolish the homocysteine rise. Um, and modeling of the enzyme shows that all C677T is, is just a minor decrease in the binding affinity of the enzyme for the riboflavin. And what the human studies show, the intervention studies in humans, is that that binding activity has got to be off by only a little bit because only a little bit of riboflavin fixes it right so i think you're i mean i think you're right that 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 will be a longevity influence if you don't address it but no one for no one is mthfr going to be their primary 
genetic piece of information that's going to be like their primary unlock. Um, and I, I think that people have a very uh, distorted view of this because of the internet support groups where people with MTHFR get together and they talk about their symptoms and they wind up saying, oh, everyone in this MTHFR group has this, 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 and this. All the studies are wrong. It does so much else. Um, but of you can pay, like if you do it like that, you can pay anything you want on MTHFR because everyone's got MTHFR. So all you have to do is put the people looking for a support group together into one support <laughs> support group, and pretty much everyone looking for help has MTHFR. Except you know, e- even if I mean, I I would go into a support group and I need help, and I I wouldn't have MTHFR, but I'm like thirteen percent of people, right? So that just allows people to grossly exaggerate what MTHFR is doing. It's like Hmm. it's like um you know you you hear some of these stories and you're like uh that doesn't happen to 87 percent of people so that's not mthfr um and i'm I'm not saying again i i'm not i don't mean to um minimize its importance like if you are riboflavin deficient and you have mthfr especially if you have other genetic um interactions with the methylation pathway, you can wind up having things kind of pile on top of each other in a negative way. In fact, like it's conceivable that someone has there, if you take all the, there's enough common polymorphisms that interact with MTHFR that you can put yourself in the category if they're all stacked on top of each other, where you've got a 50% decrease in folate uptake into the cell, you've got a 70 something percent decrease in uh, the enzyme that precedes MTHFR, you've got a 75% decrease in MTHFR and you compound those and you can have a pretty severe deficiency, but that's that's probably more common than having one of the very severe MTHFR mutations. It's like one in 200,000 people are homozygous for, for them. Um, but it's, but it's not, but it's not that common. Um, What I'm talking about in general is that let's say you have the severe defects in MTHFR, the rate from newborn screenings of severe MTHFR mutations is one in 200,000. No one knows how common it is to be heterozygous for it, but the parents of the babies and children that are found in newborn screening with massively elevated homocysteine. The parents have homocysteine that's on the order of 70s, 80s, 90s. And homocysteine has a very strong anti-fertility effect, which means that the rate of carriers who have homocysteine in the 70s, 80s, 90s, sometimes it's in the 50s, 60s, um, that's probably a lot higher than you would expect from a back calculation of one in 200,000 homozygosity. Because if homocysteine causes infertility, that means that a lot of infertility, and you know, you expect it, it goes up when, um, when people are trying and they get IVF, but you also have to take into account like how much fertility is by accident, right? So like the, um, a lot of people don't know the accidental pregnancies that they didn't cause, but it was probably like multiple with multiple people, right? So, um, so the reality is that like there would be a lot. You would probably have a way more. My guess is that you could have ten or twenty times higher incidence of the heterozygosity for the severe mutation than you would expect from looking at one in 200,000 homozygous incidents. And if you look at homocysteine curves, um, there is a huge rightward, a mirrored, right? So rightward skew of the homocysteine curves, meaning um, it's it's a bell curve, but then there's this long right tail that is the, uh, the just the little tail of people with crazy high homocysteine levels. And if you're looking at adults in a population that has diabetes, you're looking at that and you're saying, yep, those, those are the people with poor kidney function because they're not cleaning, clearing the homocysteine out. But I found a study of high schoolers in Europe where 
the right tail looked the same. There was 1% of these kids. There's no way on earth this is explainable by a high incidence of renal impairment in high schoolers, right? It's just they're not old enough to have that renal impairment. And there's still a heavy rightward skew of homocysteine where there's just 1% of these people have homocysteine 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, and so I think a lot of, I'm not saying all of it, but I think a significant percentage of that could be rare mutations that no one's looking for in MTHFR. And that's the type of thing that I'm talking about, right? So right. that might be that might be someone's. Mine, as far as I can tell right now, is a mutation in uh, an enzyme called ACAD9, which plays a dual role in fatty acid oxidation and the mitochondrial respiratory chain. And I'm finding that Supplementing with riboflavin and altering my macros around that specific mutation is the highest payload thing that I've done in my life above and beyond the low-hanging fruit of the types of things that I think everyone should do. Um, you know, so I, I think that there's there's enough of those that each person is gonna have something different and it's not gonna be what anyone's talking about. Mm, gotcha. Is there like, is there a way for the average person to discover those bottlenecks without, you know, having such, you know, you will probably like recognize those things uh, much faster than the average person or, you know, the average person will, they will might, they might do their genetics. They might know if they have the MTHFR or not. They might know if they have like some other bad genes for heart disease or whatever, but um, yeah, like what, how do they go about finding those uh, bottlenecks? Yeah. Yeah, they they don't. So um, the the best thing that you can do is is get whole genome sequencing instead of getting um, instead of getting SMP chip genome sequencing. Mm. So uh, so this like this is the problem with the genetics that everyone's focusing on. In the SMP chip companies like Twenty Three and Me or Ancestry, they uh, they're not sequencing your DNA. They are testing you on a binary uh, test for each single nucleotide polymorphism that they're interested in. And the way that they do that is there's basically ink spots for each person in a batch that are splattered onto a chip that go, they cluster in one direction or the other for being um, positive or negative for that single nucleotide polymorphism. And the way that the methodology works is they look at the clustering and then they say, okay, this is the dividing line based on how the clustering looks. I mean, it's not a person who does it. It's a computer system, but it looks mathematically at like, oh, people are clustering over here and one here's one cluster. So this is the line. These people have G, these people have C or what, you know, whatever the, the SNP is, right? The problem with that is that when it's common, it's accurate because you have a robust sample size of people in both clusters. If you're looking for something that's rare, it's anti-accurate because you have almost no one on one side of the chip. And so recent research shows that SMP chips are 84% inaccurate, mm, wow. it, meaning they give you the wrong answer 84% of the time when they are looking at something that has one an allele frequency less than one in a thousand. So on that basis alone, now, if you have something in, a, in the report that the company gave you, if it's a rare gene, they probably did like five different tests to try to corroborate that they have the correct answer for that. But if it's in your raw data and you import it into some third-party algorithm, you're feeding the algorithm 84% inaccurate data on all the rare stuff. Mm. Uh, so even if they're including it in a sample like that, you know, so by contrast, the technique that's used in whole genome sequencing is um, actually looking at what nucleotide is there. And so it's not perfect, um, but it's, you know, it's above 90% accuracy. And then what they do is they read your genome 30 times, 50 times, a hundred times, um, and 90 upwards of 90% accuracy becomes way upwards of 99, you know, point, whatever number of nines accuracy. Um, and you can do, you can get a lot out of 
getting all of, you know, selecting an all reports option. So if you like, usually these companies say like 200 bucks as the baseline for doing your genome, then like 200 bucks for our reports or 50 bucks for one of them. Um, it's like, so if you just get an all report function add on to the basic genome from a whole genome sequencing and not whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, um, whole, neither of these are whole anything, but whole exome sequencing is 2% of the genome and whole genome sequencing is, um, is 90% of the genome. So mm. it's nice. They, they speak for themselves. Um, the numbers do. Uh, so if you just get all like their reports, I think you, that's a good starting place. Um, but what I'm doing right now, like what I'm in the sort of like the next big thing that I'm working on is, um, I'm working, uh, I partnered up with someone in my membership program who is a software engineer who, um, has not commercialized this app yet, but he's letting me use it and I can upload someone's raw data and then I can go in and I can, I can search by gene and look at every mutation there and see which ones are um, cross-referenced with uh, databases of prediction models of what it does to the gene, databases of clinical reports of disorders associated with that gene. And I can go through and I can say, okay, like within the context of energy metabolism, there's these 20 mutations that stand out, but then we can rate them by, um, you know, how, like which ones have consistent reports of diseases associated with them in the ClinVar database, which is a clinical variations database where people support putative mutations that are responsible for genetic diseases, um, which ones are supported by uh, computer modeling that they do something bad. Um, and then like, then I can cross-reference that with the person's lab data and I can say, okay, you have these three genes look particularly bad. These two genes are highly correlated with the weird things in your data that are other otherwise not explainable. You know, so I hope that this, I hope there's a way to scale this, but the truth is that I'm doing it at the mic, like exceedingly micro scale level now. Um, mm. but that doesn't change the fact that I, that I just, I'm at the point where I, I would not recommend anyone waste money on a 23 and me from a health perspective these days, because I have seen what the, tip of this iceberg looks like in myself and 10 other people. Um, and I've also seen the recent data quantifying, right? Like, so I'm, I'm pairing this with recent data from the, um, what was it called? The million exome study where they took whole exome sampling, which again is 2% of the genome, not not 90% like whole genome. So this is a gross underestimate of the possible mutations. But they took a million people and they looked at the whole exome samples and they said, okay, how many genes in the population are there for things that are associated with rare genetic disorders in the ClinVar database that have a grading of two or higher, which a grading of two stars in the ClinVar database means there are multiple practitioners who have submitted a report and there's no conflicts between them, right? So if someone says it's pathogenic, someone says it's not pathogenic, it's not two stars. But if there's at least two different people submitting the reports that both say it's pathogenic, that would be a two star rating. So that's where I took the the data when I said one or two people carry something. The average number of of rare gene mutations that would not be found in this SNP chip assay, but can be found through whole genome sequencing, that have consistent multiple reports from different submitters in the ClinVar database as being putatively associated with a genetic disease. The average is one point six per person. Okay. Now that's from whole exome se sequencing. So it's it's probably an underestimate. So it's probably something like two to four per person. And that doesn't, I'm not saying like everyone's got two genetic diseases. What I'm saying is if there's two to four of these per person, and let's say that 30% of them pan out to be very significant impacts in metabolism, that means the average person has one one um, bottleneck in their metabolism that grossly out weighs the net result of averaging together the 500,000 polymorphisms that are making things go up or down 5%, right? Like if you, um, and part, part of the problem too also is 
that these things are nonlinear. Okay. So I have, let's go back to me for a second. I have an ACAD 9 that works and I have an ACAD 9 that doesn't work. If the ACAD 9 that works requires 1.3 milligrams of riboflavin per day, and the ACAD 9 that doesn't work requires 400 milligrams of riboflavin per day, I do not have a linear response to riboflavin. I have 50% of ACAD 9 working with the first 1.3 milligrams of riboflavin, and then I need hundreds of milligrams to get the other some portion of the other 50% to work. Right. So this this is um this is like a uh it's sort of like a binary like you may need to me- like you may need to be on a carnivore diet or you may need to supplement with 500 milligrams of thiamine or you may need to supplement with 200 milligrams of riboflavin or you should not use CoQ10 or like just come up with with all of these things where it's it's not um it's not a linear response to many things. It's one thing that should be avoided or one thing that should be mega dosed. Um, and I, it just makes no sense to me that, um, I mean, we have to deal with the fact that, that we have not scaled the analysis of these things. It's, it's what I'm working on right now. Um, but I just, I would just say, just like, wait, chill out, like stop micro analyzing, um, the 500,000 things that are, that are not doing much in you and, and focus on like the general principles. And then, and then hopefully we can kind of in the next few years, find some way to really scale looking at those highly individual things in each person. That's the way I'm seeing it. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's, that's pretty, uh, you know, eye opening in a lot of ways. And you know, the, the, I guess like the bottlenecks also vary in degrees. Uh, you know, someone has a, like a very oh, yeah. more serious bottleneck, and the other one might not notice anything. Like subjectively, they don't feel that they have a bottleneck, <laughs> but they might do. So yeah, like you know, there's a huge degree and range in this I as can, well. Yeah, I totally, totally, one hundred percent agree with that. But even still, let's say that you know, consider this non-linearity, right? Like. Let's say that your carbohydrate metabolism works good enough that you don't notice any problems on 1.1 milligrams of thiamine per day, but you can't, but you are otherwise supercharged because you have done everything right and all your other genes make you a high level athlete that will probably live to 120 years old. Mm -hmm. Right. But you have one problem in your carbohydrate metabolism that will only work correctly in the presence of 500 milligrams of thiamine a day. Mm. You might not ever notice any problems, but once you've taken home the silver in some Olympic sport, it's quite possible that like the one thing that you could do to get gold Mm. is actually add the 500 milligrams of thiamine. Right. That you didn't know you needed to optimize your carbohydrate metabolism, you know, because eh, it doesn't matter to your blood sugar on a day to day life, but damn straight, it matters when you're trying to be one fraction of a second faster than the next person. And the way that you get faster in that moment is to burn a little extra carbohydrate. Mm. <laughs> right. And like, yeah. and I, you know, and that, that like, also, maybe that's the way that you get your extra 10 years. Maybe you'll live to 95 and maybe you would have lived to 105 if you had figured out the time and thing. Like, and it's so it's not, you're not trying to solve a problem so much as it becomes a, you don't really need to optimize this last piece, but that, but that last piece might be the piece that really makes like, oh, a high impact puzzle fit together that you didn't know was there, you know? Mm, right. So you are working on that. Uh, do you know like any other companies right now that do the whole genome sequencing? There are a number. Uh, I have used Dante Labs for myself and a number of clients this year. 
only in the last month I've been getting complaints from several clients that their Dante results are taking longer than they should and they're not getting an explanation for it. Uh, and I know Nebula is another company that a lot of people have been using and I haven't gotten a chance to use them myself or analyze any genomes from it. But from my perspective, it doesn't really matter. It's whole genome is whole genome and anything else is everything else. Um, and I'm not at the point yet where I can say uh, this company is better than that company. I was using Dante just because a few other people had used it. it they were getting results from it. So I was like, oh, I'll do that for myself. I was getting results from it. So I started recommending it to other people. They were getting results from it. Um, but it it doesn't, the company doesn't matter that much though. It's the whole genome sequencing methodology that differentiates whole genome from all the other stuff. Um, and the company, like maybe the quality of their reports differs or their customer service differs, but the the make or break thing is that it's whole genome sequencing. Gotcha. Right. And, you know, the thing, because think of it this way too. Um, you, do, it's not an all or nothing thing that you learned everything from your genome. Like if you just get the, all the reports that are available now, um, there's a certain amount of information you can learn from that, but you still have the whole genome sequenced. And so that can be the basis for reports that that company issues in the future or can be the basis of working with me in the future on a deeper analysis of the raw data or whatever it is, um, you're not limited to whatever the reports currently are in that mm -hmm. sense. Right. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, we've been <laughs> going pretty deep with all these topics and I, I don't want to like go into another rabbit hole <laughs> with another uh topic like choline or gmo and those things so we'll do like another future episode about that but uh, yeah like is there anything else you want to add to the end before we uh, stop um not really i mean i i would just i guess summarize a bit and say that when you're Looking at longevity, I think the first thing that you want to look at is a time-dependent, probability-dependent strategy to make it through all the causes of death. And when you're young, you want to be thinking about putting on peak bone mass and peak muscle mass, and you want to be thinking about uh, injury prevention, right? Because mm -hmm. if you, so, I would say, I would say through, and this becomes more important when you're older, but it's much better to start when you're younger. Um, you know, if you're, if you're starting out in your twenties training, um, I would sooner rather than later start maybe meeting with a physical therapist once a year, who's qualified to do a functional movement screen or some other type of movement therapist who's qualified to do a functional movement screen and work on, um, high quality movement and injury prevention at that point, because, when you know if you imagine the person who falls and breaks their hip and dies a year later there's numerous things going on and it wasn't just about bone density or muscle mass it was also about neuromuscular control and movement patterns mm -hmm. um and i mean and there's so much suffering that goes alongside that like chronic back pain and stuff that you would also not be dealing with when you get to that age if you, you've thought about those things so i think starting young you really want to be thinking about um, muscle mass, bone mass, and, and high quality movement patterns that are checked by an expert in, in functional movement patterns. Um, and I, and then I think, uh, you know, going forward to think about, um, diabetes, like respiratory infections and diabetes, I think mostly comes down to having a good diet on, on factors that most diet war camps would probably agree on, right? Like if you find the consensus among the paleo vegan carnivore, um, South beach Atkins, uh, whatever is the new thing is like the, you know, the obvious things like mostly eat whole foods, um, you know, eat well-rounded enough to get all your nutrients. And I think, uh, that plus the movement stuff that I just mentioned, is probably the strongest diabetes prevention pack that you can have. And I think getting good nutrition is generally going to cover most infections. Um, 
and heart disease, I think you can layer on some stuff with like, look at your blood lipids and tweak that a bit. Uh, I think cancer is a lot more, uh, there's a much greater controversy over cancer, but I think most of these things are also going to protect you in that realm. Um, and I, so I think, you know, eat well, move well, get outside, get good sunshine, properly sleep and manage stress. That bucket, I, I think when you check those boxes and you've checked the, like the sort of specific boxes along the line of disease prevention, um, I think after that, it's you want to better understand your uniqueness. And I, I want, I don't want it to come across as super hopeless in terms of the last conversation that we had, where it's like, um, you know, I'm going into the raw data of esoteric genetic analysis to find the next thing. I, I, I strongly stand by everything that I said there. But if you want kind of a poor man's uh, version of finding, genetic idiosyncrasies, I think self-experimentation is the key to that, right? So rather than looking at a mouse study of like, do carbohydrates make mice live longer? I think you want to say, do I have good body composition, good blood sugar and feel well on a high carb diet or on a low carb diet? And you can do that with carbs. You can do it with protein. You can do it with fat and you can do it with types of foods you can do with supplements. And if you can find the sweet spot between effortless, good body composition and feeling well, um, you know, on the, and there's various things you can look at. You can look at your blood pressure. You can look at your blood sugar. You can look at how often do you get sick? You can look at, do I feel rested when I wake up in the morning? You can look at, do I feel fatigued all day or do I feel good? Um, you know, all those, all those very general things, boxes you could check about being able to confidently say, yes, I am a healthy person. When, if you, if you self-experiment and find where that sweet spot is for you, um, I think that is more accessible, more empowering, and ultimately higher quality, both than taking longevity uh, mouse studies and generalizing them to yourself and looking at uh, 40 reports of 500,000 out of the 6 million polymorphisms that you have and getting, you know, 300 pages of things that you should do with your, with your diet. Right. Like I think, I think just simplifying it and saying, experimenting and saying like, where is the sweet spot for me is probably going to be, um, the simple way to find the genetic idiosyncrasies that I, that we were talking about in the data intensive way. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Like, like the mice and uh, other animals, they, you know, the, in the lab environment, they live in a completely different <laughs> setting. And I don't think like anyone would like to swap places with those animals, even if they live longer, like being hungry and, uh, the uh, scientists are injecting you with different stuff or, or putting like under cold or heat or whatever. So it's not, not like a fun life <laughs> to live for sure in those uh, laboratory uh, environments. <laughs> but yeah, uh, especially yeah. if there's, especially if there's no hamster wheel in the cage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it was great talking with you and uh, yeah, we'll probably do like another one in the future about cool. uh, other topics. Yeah. I'd love to. All right. It was great talking with you. All right. Take care, man. But do you want to slow down aging and live longer? If yes, then I'm looking for more people who want to reverse their biological clock. If you're interested, then email me the word health to info at seamland.com and I'll send you the details.